I'll try to be good on the time. Um, hi, so I'm Tristan Sainsbury. I'm from the Lowy Institute for International Policy. Uh, talking on economic diplomacy, I'll, I'll go a little bit broader than the remit of the, um, the institutions. One of the reasons is one of my Lowy Institute non-resident fellow colleagues, Mike, Mike Callahan, has also written uh, a paper for this conference. And he deals with some of the strategic implications about the, um, the, the G20 and regional fora. And I'd, I'd recommend trying to read his paper when you get a chance. So on economic diplomacy, a, a role that I've heard about in the, uh, in the cyber security realm is of a vulnerability assessor. That is, someone who's on the outside, who tries to devise ways to defeat a system's protections and identify vulnerabilities. When Sue harris rimmer mentioned to me that she was interested in learning more about economic diplomacy as part of this excellent symposium, I thought of, that a vulnerability assessment would actually be quite a useful way to approach the task. So that is, someone who is clearly on the outside of the economic diplomacy framework, who's looking in and, he's try and who's trying to identify some of the vulnerabilities. So the first stage about this, I think, is when I've mentioned I've been doing this paper, the most common initial reaction I've actually received has been, oh, so you're going to finally tell me what the economic diplomacy uh, actually means, are you? And so it makes it quite clear there, there's actually no common, there's no well understood definition for economic diplomacy. There have been frameworks unveiled in Australia, like-minded countries like Canada and the UK, but the definition uh, underpinning these frameworks remains, I think the, you can call it creatively ambiguous. I'm sure that there are some, some valid reasons behind this, and I'd be interested for those in the room who actually have the expertise uh, if they could, could kind of elaborate on this. But from my perspective, I think it actually acts as a barrier in implementing a cohesive vision that would actually be of, of, of most use to modern diplomats. Now, it, this also might just be the academic in me, but who, who likes to define things. But I think I would just suggest that a phrase here. I, w I would say it's the set of informal and formal processes, and it's the links between states and as well as non-state actors on international economic issues. Broad, and I'd be interested in your in, in reactions to this as well. Now, let's go to the nuts and bolts, the economic diplomacy framework as, as Australia sees it. And this is the, the framework that DFAT's elaborated. It's about promoting prosperity chiefly through four key pillars. It's about liberalising trade, particularly about bilateral and regional trade. It's on, um, it, on economic growth, boosting economic growth, primarily through aid and regional and global uh, cooperation and the forums. It's about encouraging investment and it's about advancing Australian business. Now, you take this and economic diplomacy can either be typically viewed as the new cornerstone of foreign policy or the other extreme, it could be seen as a partial and a distorted vision for how to effectively bolster a, com uh, a country's economic and commercial interests. Now, it seems to me that the, um, the framework itself has a, um, and its focus on prosperity, it has the scope to be this new cornerstone. But I think the looking into the, the, the detail of this, and it just feels like this, the more of the partial and the distorted vision. And uh, there are two principal de design flaws that have led me to this. Um, one is that the Four Pillars Economic Diplomacy Framework. It's incomplete and it misses the bigger economic picture. The second side of this is its inconsistent application of, of economic principles to foreign affairs policy issues. It means that for issues like with the decisions on the AIIB and strategic decision making that goes to um, to, to that and uh, when Australia should actually join the institution. These are ex perfect examples of, um, of, of ca oh, perfect case examples disproving that economic diplomacy and a framework that's uh, prioritising economic principles would, would actually be, um, be, be taking the lead on a policy. So I'm going to look at these in turn, but first looking at the G20. So it's on the breadth of the, the economic diplomacy. I think the best way to think about this is actually within the G20 last year. And this is because Treasury, the RBA, and PM&C have all taken a prominent role in the economic diploma uh, in during the course of the host year. Task forces were established in Treasury and RBA to prosecute finance track issues like growth, financial regulation, the international financial architecture, investment and tax, 
and within PM&C for sh the Sherpa track issues like climate change, energy governance, anti-corruption, trade, development and agriculture broad suite of issues requiring a genuinely whole of government response and a whole of government response came through. DFAT's role within this was to define the G20's ad, uh, agenda in tra on traditional foreign policy spaces, I'm thinking trade and development in particular. And the diplomatic uh, network of DFAT has played a under, I think a quite underappreciated role in gathering information and, provi and, and uh, negotiating developments in G20 countries that were relevant for the Australian agenda and I would put growth strategies and the success that Australia, I, I argue Australia has had in the growth strategies as part of this process. However, the practice was that the control of the agenda was within PM&C or was within the Prime Minister's area, was within the Treasury and it was in the, and the, the Finance Ministers and it was in the RBA and the Central Bank Governor's space. This means that for the most important economic diplomatic event in, in, in Australian history, we've had po um, policy experts, economic and policy experts, having control of the agenda and not <coughs> traditional foreign policy um, actors. And this is a trend that's likely to continue, not least because the G20 progresses microeconomic policy coordination, international tax, financial regulation, IMF reform. These are all highly technical um, areas where the expertise and networks that have been developed are actually not all that well suited to the background of the, f the generalist foreign affairs officials. Now, onto the, um, the inconsistent application of economic principles. And I'm gonna talk about two further case examples here. This is trade and this is the foreign aid. So I'm looking at the growth side and the trade side of the two uh, pillars here. My paper also goes into the other ones. So. The big story here on trade is about the prioritisation of bilateral and regional trade, which is actually the direct opposite of the emphasis that would be made if you were just primarily basing the decision on foreign policy consider uh, sorry on economic considerations. So last week I was um, I was actually present at the talk at the Lowy Institute from from the DFAT secretary, where he noted that uh, the ultimate success in trade comes not from trade agreements, but from a domestic economy which places a premium on productivity and competitiveness. That, in, in other words, substantive economic policies for creating trade generally fall within the realms of domestic economic policy settings. The economic credentials of bilateral and, and regional trade deals actually look quite decidedly weak. Let's look at the, the, the three recent FTAs, China, Korea, and Japan. And let's look at the Center for International Economic uh, Estimates for the value of, of these, um, the, these arrangements in 20 years time. And the GDP growth is expected to be uh, in the order of 0.05% to 0.11% in 20 years. So think, think about this as the difference in, uh, in Australian GDP today to, the different, uh, to Australian GDP next Friday. And that's not the total amount produced in that week. That is the difference that's taking next Friday's GDP, subtracting today's GDP, and it's the difference. That's your gross benefit. There may be an argument to say that, that you argue on an opportunity cost um, basis. You say, okay, if other countries like New Zealand have FTAs with these guys, but we don't, then uh, we're actually going to decline relative to a, um, a no change other than a scenario where we actually implement these. I haven't seen any estimates which suggest that the economic effects are going to be uh, drastically different. So I'm yet to, so I'd be interested to see if those numbers are around, but the, uh, the way I look at it, you, you, have the co you, you look at the costs that go into the negotiations, you look at the benefits, and uh, it it's, seems like a reasonably difficult argument to make. Mega regional arrangements like the Trans-Pacific Partnership do not actually offer a significant improvement. A lot of, uh, so a lot of you in this building will have a lot more access to better information on this than I do. But, as my Low uh, Lowy Institute colleague Leon Berkelman has, has said, and said frequently, there's, there doesn't seem to be a lot of upside to Australia coming from the, um, the, the, the deal. What we do see, though, as, a, as Australia is a net importer of intellectual capital, and particularly with some of the US provisions about pushing for, for intellectual capital um, uh, parts of the agreement, is that there's actually a significant downside risk to Australia. And so from, and then on top of that, you add, there's a, from a global point of view, any partial arrangement, even one that um, 
that, that deals with 40% of the world's economy still has a significant risk of creating trade diversion rather than trade creation. And so the global benefits are, are certainly not clear. And so from an economic framework, the greatest gains that you can always point to will be, will be to push for multilateral trade. Yes, it's a challenging space, but the breakthroughs that can actually deliver a real boost in global prosperity will be from a prosecuting an agenda at a leader level focused on fixing the way multilateral trade decisions are actually made. Now, trade cynics are a particularly sceptical group of cynic, and I think it can be quite uh, easily argued that Australia can only do so much, and particularly wh when there's only, um, the, without the political will to revive the multilateral trading system. However, my argument here is badging this as a macroeconomic policy argument sends a clear signal that economic diplomacy just simply ignores cost-benefit analysis. And so the f a focus on re meg regional and mega re um, um, uh, sorry, yeah, regional and bilateral trade agreements just doesn't stack up with the economics. Now, on aid, I just uh, I'd actually like to invoke the secretary's comments from from last week one more time. At the Q and A in the same speech last week, he said Australian aid should be about maximising economic opportunity and minimising strategic risk. Further that the real focus of aid should be about how, should it, how it should contribute to economic growth, and the touchstone priority needs to be on sustainable economic growth, given the flow of aid is a relatively infinitesimal proportion of both financial flows and total development finance. Aid effectiveness, as he's reiterated again today, I think quite effectively, it's, it's an appropriate, it is a definitely an appropriate objective. But here's the issue I have looking at it from the economic framework. The direct relationship between aid and growth remains highly controversial. For every claim from a Jeffrey Sachs out there that there's a large impact, there are others that will be suggesting there's no relationship at all. Moreover, there are strong questions about the validity of econometric methods that establish any link. Australia's aid volumes are not large enough for any statistically significant impact on their own in any case, and I think there are strong questions about the merits about placing growth as the centrepiece for any argument on Australian aid. This is before we take into account broader geopolitical um, context and the fact that aid is increasingly, Australian aid is increasingly appearing outside global norms. This is both international norm, norms in terms of the, the quantum of assistance and domestic norms in terms of what our Australian population actually think and want our aid program's objectives to be about. So the, where I come out at it, of this, the economist's perspective, <coughs> Australia may be actually undermining its longer term non-economic soft power benefits by pursuing so actively and so blatantly an economic and a, um, a, a um, national interest focused program. Okay, so now where, what, where I come at with all these three examples is that the, um, the focus on, yeah, actually, um, Economic, so some would argue that this could mean that, that economic diplomacy should not be taken seriously. I disagree. I think the remarks from uh, Peter Barghese this morning, again, were the most um, appropriate and, and uh, I, I don't think I can say all that much in, in a short time to actually improve on those. But I will, so I'll, I'll try and wrap up with, with, with two thoughts. The first is that these case examples tell you that the framework needs to be targeted differently. Take the emphasis away from flawed policy pillars. The focus instead needs to be on ensuring economic considerations are embedded in all decision-making processes. DFAT's comparative advantage is in its overseas presence. This is where I would argue the focus should be. This is about making sure that economic considerations are part of the, the, the everyday decision-making matrix. The other one is the way Australia approaches international economics needs to be more actively considered by a genuinely whole of government decision making process and a more structured approach to the strategic engagement. And this builds on uh, the points that I think Mike Callahan makes in his paper. So this involves, this is a more structural development of economic strategic priorities. The G20, I would argue, needs to be at the centre of this, it needs to be channeled primarily through economic agencies. But I think there will be a place for DFAT, prominent place for DFAT in ensuring foreign affairs perspective is a key part of the process. Thank you.